Abraham Lincoln stands out among America's great men as the leader who proved that democracy can overcome tremendous problems and still survive. That freedom and a government that protects freedom are worthy of men's faith. He was born in the backwoods of Kentucky in 1809, the son of Thomas and Nancy Hanks Lincoln. When young Abe was seven, the family moved to Indiana, where at the age of nine, he met the first great tragedy of his life, the death of his mother. But life in the backwoods was too busy to let grief stop the work. Although Abe took his place, helping to clear the land and plant and harvest the crops, he found stimulation in his discovery of books and learned about the world beyond the backwoods. Come on, son. Don't stand there gaping. Go out and unhitch the horses. Now, Thomas Lincoln, where are your manners? Decent folks always makes introductions before they do the chores. I'm Sarah, your new mother. I suppose you're Abraham. Yes, ma'am. Kind of skinny, aren't you, son? But not puny, either. Go hunting a lot, do you? No, ma'am. Him? No hunting for him. Oh, he does his chores all right. But the rest of the time he's reading or studying or mooning or something about in his head. I like to try to figure things out. You go out and unload the wagon, son. And be careful, because there's real furniture in there. In the spring of 1830, the Lincoln family moved again, this time to Illinois. Tell me about it again, Abe. It's really something to see. The old French town, the crowds, the old plantation houses on the banks of the river. Yes, New Orleans is quite a place. Strange faces and strange tongues and strange things. Selling slaves in the marketplace. Fair sours a stomach to see it. Sounds like a good place to visit. Bad place to stay. At least it's on the Mississippi. But you know, the Sangamon River is as pretty as the Mississippi. Pretty near. Come on, Abe. Well, it's home. Home will look mighty good to you, too, John, when we get back. Good old Sangamon County, eh? It's new, and it's growing, John. That's where the opportunity is. Opportunity for what? You're the best man in the Sangamon River with an axe. And the best wrestler and the best storyteller. Wants to be a big frog in a little puddle. Illinois will be a thriving state someday, John. And I aim to be there helping out. That New Salem, where they have the new mill, that's a right brisk little place. Lincoln went back to New Salem, Illinois, where he worked as a clerk in a country store. He quickly became a leader in the settlement. And when Governor Reynolds called out the militia in the Black Hawk War, Lincoln, the most popular fighter in the area, was elected captain of his company. He never fired a shot, and when the war was over, went back to the store, where he used moments to study law. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us another, Abe. You got such a slick tongue, you ought to be a politician. Politics? Abe ain't for politics. He's too honest and hard work. Never doing politics. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows too much. Politicians supposed to be thick-headed. Least ways they all are at Vandalia. <laughs> Is it true you're planning to run for the legislature? Well, now, I wasn't ready to announce it yet, but since you fellas demand that I run, I guess I'll have to consent. Then you gotta make a speech. Fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. A politics is short and sweet like an old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank. I am in favor of the internal improvement system and a high protective tariff. If elected, I shall be thankful. If not, it'll be all the same. <laughs> Although Lincoln was defeated in his first try for the state legislature, he was later successful. And in 1834, the tall, slow-speaking man became leader of the minority party. When his term was over, he returned to New Salem and began to practice law. In 1837, Abraham Lincoln, riding on a borrowed horse, with all his possessions in the saddlebags, moved to Springfield, soon to be the capital of Illinois. There, he became a junior partner in a law firm, where his directness, his humor, his integrity, and common sense soon made him both respected and successful. Imagine Mary Todd. 
choosing that homely Lincoln with all the bows she had. It'll be a come down for Miss Todd with her charm and spirit marrying a backwoodsman. Lincoln's an up-and-coming lawyer. Five years after his marriage, Abraham Lincoln was in Congress. There he introduced a bill to free the slaves of the District of Columbia and made a speech against the Mexican War. Although he made many friends in Washington, he refused to run for another term, preferring to go home to Springfield. How would you like to go to Oregon, Bob? Real Indians out there. I'd like it. Is that what's in that letter you've been brooding about for the last hour? Yes, it's from Addison. He says my friends are interested in having me appointed governor of Oregon Territory. It could be a real opportunity, Mary. To be scalped, yes. Now we have to think of school for the boys and the future. My friends think that when Oregon becomes a state, I might go to Washington as its first senator. Maybe I'd do better in the capital as a senator. If you really want to get back into national politics, then you'll start right from here again. Why, it would be foolish to move out to an unsettled territory like Oregon. Oh, Ma. Looks like we'll have to forget those Indians, son. At least for a while. Although he was not active in politics, for the next five years, Lincoln practiced law in Illinois, riding from one county seat to another. His skill before a jury, common sense, concern for justice and fair play spread his fame. And soon, the powerful issues of the day drew him back into politics. Although opposed to extremists on both sides of the slavery question, Abraham Lincoln was anti-slavery. And it was in Peoria, in 1854, that he declared himself. This indifference for the spread of slavery I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. In 1858, Lincoln was at the Republican State Convention in Springfield. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently, half slave and half free. It was here that he was nominated for United States Senator. His opponent was the little giant, Stephen Douglas. In a series of seven meetings which made history, Lincoln and Douglas debated the issue of slavery. The doctrine of Lincoln and his party, that states with different ideas cannot endure together in the Union, is revolutionary and destructive of the very existence of this government. I favor popular sovereignty. Let each state and territory do as it pleases on the subject of slavery. My good friend, Judge Douglas, thinks I'm a dangerous man. He gives you his great principle of popular sovereignty. But my friends, slavery is wrong. And Douglas cannot say he'd as soon see a wrong voted up as voted down. I combat Douglas's great principle. I combat it as having a tendency to dehumanize the Negro, to take away from him the right of ever striving to be a man. Although Douglas won the senatorial race, Abraham Lincoln's words had a profound effect upon the rest of the nation. And in 1860, the Republican Party nominated Lincoln as its presidential candidate. My friends, no one can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this party. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I am pleased not knowing when or whether I may return. But the task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. I bid you an affectionate farewell. Before Lincoln was inaugurated, seven states had seceded from the Union. And in his inaugural address, Lincoln tried to avoid war. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict 
without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. A month later, the newly formed Confederacy of the South fired upon Fort Sumter, and President Lincoln was forced into the war he had sought to avoid. Things went badly for the Union at first, and in September 1862, the North was shocked by Lee's invasion of Maryland. We must have more troops, Mr. President. I don't see how we'll be able to stop Lee with what we have. It's my understanding, General McClellan, that your forces outnumber the forces of General Lee. That's true, Mr. President, but my troops have not had sufficient training, nor are we getting adequate support from Washington. The politicians are trying Now, to... General, you don't need to tell me what the politicians are doing. They want to run the war. But then, so do you generals, and so does everybody else. After all, with a war in full swing, don't you think the generals ought to decide how it's to be fought? No, General, I don't. There's no one in the nation who's more grateful for advice than I am. Anyone who can tell me how to save the Union will receive my undying gratitude. Well, then, I believe... That... But in the long run, saving the Union is my responsibility. The people have entrusted me with the Union. It's a great trust, General, and one that I'm doing my best to be worthy of. The War Department feels very strongly. General, you're commanding the armies in the field. It would strengthen your position were you to deliver a victory for the Union. Now, please leave the victories in Washington to me. I'm afraid I'm being forced to make all the decisions. The squabbling and turmoil are reaching monumental proportions. Lincoln assumed direct control over the military, and a series of generals tried unsuccessfully to stop the brilliant Lee. Finally, Lee was repulsed in the Battle of Antietam, and Lincoln, who had been waiting for a Union victory, now decided on a momentous step. But we'll lose the election this fall if you issue this proclamation. Let me read you a piece by Artemis Ward. It's called The High-Handed Outrage at Utica. Mr. President, this is a serious meeting on a serious subject. Yes, Mr. Secretary. Situation is serious. And I know that some people object to my jokes and pleasantries. Well, others would probably do better in my place. And if anyone else could legally take the job, he could have it. But I'm here, and I'm doing the best I can. There seems to be some feeling that this is not the proper time for your emancipation proclamation to be issued. Well, as to that, there's hardly ever a proper time for anything. Back home, there's a fellow I know who waited till the proper time to get married. They had to push him up the aisle in a wheelchair. But Congress is not in session. There are times when the president must act. This is one of those times. We have the victory we've been waiting for. Lee has been defeated at Antietam, and the North is ready for emancipation to be proclaimed. As for Congress, I consider this a presidential function. This time is as good a time as I have seen or can foresee to make this proclamation. I would advise against it at this time, Mr. President. Let's lay aside the question of time for now, Mr. Blair. Do you agree with the substance of this proclamation? That on the 1st of January, 1863, the slaves of all persons and in rebellion shall be declared free? Well, yes, it's a good idea, sir. I think we can agree, Mr. President, that this proclamation is a statesmanlike and humanitarian document. But not very good politics, is that it? Well, gentlemen, the time has come to stand for the Union and for freeing the slaves above all. We must not play politics in this crisis. I call on you for support, gentlemen, for I am going to issue this proclamation. And so a race rose from bondage. Not only in the United States, but in England and Europe, Lincoln's proclamation was hailed as a noble act of statesmanship. But the war went on. Casualties were heavy on both sides. And in November 1863, President Lincoln went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to dedicate a cemetery. He hoped to honor the war dead and state firmly the principles for which they had died. Mr. President, I don't want to bother you while you're working on your speech, but I thought you might enjoy a glass of cold milk. 
Thank you, Mr. Wills. Your hospitality is generous beyond measure. The speech is finished at last. I've rewritten it several times, but I think this should do it. Would you like to hear it? Oh, indeed, sir. If it's not too long, you should be in bed soon. Sit down, then. This is how it goes. It's very short. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The struggle for the Union approached a climax. Lincoln was re-elected, and in March 1865, he was inaugurated for his second term. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. A month later, the army ceased fighting as the great Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant. And Abraham Lincoln could now devote his energies and efforts to bringing harmony to the Union so lately split by war. We meet not in sorrow, but in gladness of heart. And I can think of nothing more fitting than that the band play a special favorite of mine, Dixie. On April 14th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth, a fanatic Southern sympathizer, and he died early in the morning of the next day. His faith, his works, and his principles have established him as one of the great exponents of human freedom. His life was dedicated to the proposition that democracy is a workable form of government, and he demonstrated conclusively that a nation of by and for the people need not perish from the earth.